Welcome back, my friends, to Earth's Final Countdown. This is a continuation, remember, of Unlocking Bible Prophecies. It's so exciting to have you back. My name is Dr. Dwayne McKee. I'm president of Adventist World Radio. This series will open just for the Bible. It's only for the Bible, God's Word, the future, where we're headed, what's going to happen. You won't want to miss a one of these because we're going to find out if there's going to be a new world order, if, the, if there's going to be a, a global globalism that will take charge of everything and control our lives, some will happen, some will not. But just hang tight. We're going to tighten our seatbelts and go right into the series. Earth's final countdown. Here we are, folks, back to Earth's final countdown. We're looking at God's word to see what's going to happen in, in the near future as to the future. It's the future actually doesn't look too good, but the end, I, I've read the end of the book and I'll share that with you. The end is going to be fantastic. Actually, it's going to be out of this world. Tonight's topic, today's topic is the mark of the beast number one. The next topic that we'll be looking at is Revelation's plagues upon the land. Now tonight we have to look at, today we have to look at a little more of the mark of the beast because there's so much to this topic. We'll, we'll be excited and interested. It, it'll be thrilling to look at what God has laid out for us in the future. Remember the three things that we always want to talk about each night. Uh, the end of the book, this book, the Bible, God's word to man, to us men and women around the world. This book, this book, we're at the end of it. All the great prophecies that's what I mean by that. All the great prophecies have been fulfilled except the final one, and that is the coming of Jesus. Secondly, mama's prayers. I'm going to talk about that in just a second. My mother's prayers. Your mother prayed for you. Your father prayed for you. Somebody prayed for you. Jesus is praying for you, the Bible says, and God has a plan, number three, for your life. He has a plan for your life, for my life. He has a plan for our lives. It's exciting and thrilling to know what God's plan is, and we're going to discover that as we study together. Let me share with you a picture. This is my mother when she was 90 years old. They were farmers in the state of Oklahoma, in the central part of the United States. Dairy farmers, Jersey cows, Jersey the brown cows, the, the nice ones, the black and whites, I'm not so sure about, but the, black, the brown cows, are they're the best. They give nice creamy milk. My dad and mom love their their Jersey herd. They had about, oh, 80 cows, milked 65, 70 sometimes. This is mother though, this is, this is about seven years after they retired. This is her garden. She hold that all by hand. That's right, at 90 years old, she hold that garden by her hand. And not a weed in it, not my mother's garden. <laughs> now let's turn the clock back. It's about, oh, 10 years before I was a pastor working out in Oregon, and I flew home to see mom and dad and help them on the farm for some time. And when I got there, they, I, I looked at the calf pen and the cows and half of the dairy, and I noticed there was one little Jersey heifer calf, a little girl calf, and she, she was sick. And dad had given her medicine and stuff, and then she got sicker, and I gave her, I gave her medicine. Actually, I gave her a shot, and I held her, and I looked at her and I thought, this poor calf is so sick. And then she got blood in her stool. You know, when she used the bathroom, it was bloody. It was not, not good. My nephew, Kenneth, came by. He raised calves and he looked at that calf and he said, Uncle, that's a dead calf. <laughs> well, I thought so too. I thought that calf was going to die that night. It was laying down, couldn't get up, and it, it was kind of a mess. Mother came out, finished milking. She came out over to the, where I was and she said, let's pray for the calf. I thought, Mama, <laughs> the calf is going to die. I don't want you to have trouble with your faith. You know, you're going to pray and ask God to heal the calf, and the calf is going to die anyway. I'm a preacher, remember? I know better. <laughs> so my mother said, no, no, let's pray. And so we went to the calf pen. She knelt down in the calf pen. It's missy. Calf pens are not nice and clean, you know. It is not good. And so she knelt down in the calf pen. She put her hands up on the head of the calf and she prayed. She began to cry as she prayed for that calf, that God would touch the calf and heal it. Got up, mother always had a, a napkin or a Kleenex or something in her pocket. She pulled it out, wiped her nose, she had been crying. We walked to the barn, to, from the barn to the house. 
and, and got at the house. We had a little supper and went to bed early the next morning. And, and on dairy farms, the cows wake up early. They want to be milked. And so you have to get up before the sun comes up. And mother, as I came out dressed and came out for breakfast, she said, why don't you go out and, and feed the calf? And I wanted to say, Mama, the calf's dead. I don't, I don't want, you're going to be so brokenhearted. The calf is dead. And she said, just, just go out and feed the calf. I went there and I never will forget the sight. As I walked up to that calf pen, that calf was there wagging its tail, standing up, wanting a bottle. <laughs> I learned something, a lot about prayer and a lot about my mother. Well, three years later, three years later, the mom and dad sold the dairy and I walked around and dad looked at me and he said, son, look at that big old Jersey cow over there. And I said, yeah, he said, that's the dead calf, the prayed for calf. <laughs> Years went by and now I'm back with mother in this picture on the farm. She's 90 years old and we're talking about the dead calf. It happened 10 years before. And uh, she said, son, do you know why I prayed for that calf? Why, sure, mom, I guess we, you needed more, more dairy cows. And she said, oh no, we had plenty. She said, I prayed for that calf because I wanted you, son, to learn to believe in prayer. I wanted you to learn to believe in prayer. Touch my heart, tears came to my eyes. And I said, thank you, Mother. Through this series, I want you, Jesus wants you to learn to believe in what God says in his word. Remember, we say, if it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it's not in the Bible, it's not for me. We said that with Cammie's meeting. She said that over and over again. If it's in the Bible, I believe it. If it disagrees with the Bible, it's not for me. I, by the way, I just heard about Unlocking Bible Prophecies, our series that we're doing still over in Russia. They translated into Russian. Cammie is speaking in Russian. And they have had almost a million people watch it just in Russia. Isn't that exciting? As God's word is preached in different languages around the world. Praise the Lord for what he is doing. Jesus is doing. This series is all about Jesus, all about Jesus. It's not about anything else. You know, Jesus is special. He's, a, he's our savior. He died for our sins on Calvary's cross. It's all about Jesus. If you go to the different leaders of world religions, burial places around the world, you'll find one thing that's in, in common with all of them. Confucius, good man, lots of good things to say, but if you go to his tomb in Khufu, China, the tomb is occupied. His tomb is occupied. You go to Buddha's tomb in Kusiangara, India. Yes, Buddha too, good man, had lots of good teachings, but if you go there, you'll find out that his tomb also, like Confucius' tomb, is occupied. If you go to Muhammad's tomb in Medina, Saudi Arabia, Wow, you'll find there, too, a lot of wonderful history about Muhammad. Remember, we talked about it last night, the, the relationship between the Jews and the Arabs. But if you go to his tomb, you'll find that his tomb also is occupied. Not long ago, Kathy and I and our video team, we were in Israel. We were near Jerusalem. Outside Jerusalem is, is the garden tomb. We went there, been there before, and just like it's always been, for 2,000 years, the tomb is empty. The tomb is empty. Jesus is not there. The Bible says in Luke 24, 3, and they entered in and found not the body of the Lord Jesus. Wow, remember we talked, yes, at our last meeting about the ascension of Jesus and the promise that he's coming back to take us to the heavenly home that he's preparing for us now. Jesus' tomb in Jerusalem is empty. It's empty, so we pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for the empty tomb. I thank you for the promise that Jesus, that Jesus is coming back. Father, keep us faithful, keep us focused, and keep us focused on knowing you as our savior and sharing Jesus with the world. As AWR pushes forward to broadcast to baptism, in Christ's name I pray, amen. Wow, Mark of the Beast won. What a topic. We're going to get right into the Bible. We have a, you're going to have to fasten your seatbelts because there's just a lot, a lot to cover tonight. 
you'll enjoy this presentation a lot, but let's look first at the puzzle pieces that we have learned. Remember, God's kingdom will be, remember the, Daniel 2, we looked at, the, at Nebuchadnezzar's dream. God, by the way, if you didn't see that, just watch that too. It's on YouTube. Just go back and watch the first one. This will give you the, the history, the layout. You need to understand Daniel chapter 2, the greatest prophecy in God's word. God's kingdom will be the only one new world order to last forever. The only one. The only one. No great reset. It's not coming. There's not going to be a great reset. There's no globalism. Globalism is not coming. Well, they'll try, and they'll try to even have a day. I think a day is coming where they're going to say, we'll take one day and we're going to, we're going to not work and give the planet a rest. Well, that might happen, but in the end, in the end, God's kingdom is the only kingdom that will last forever. Prophetic signs tell us that God's kingdom is soon to come. It's coming. It's coming soon. I'm, I'm ready, aren't you? I want to get off of this old ball of mud and go home. So Jesus is coming very, very, very soon. He's coming soon. Now we're going to find out too, as we keep studying, that the star of the drama of Revelation is Jesus. Remember, it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's all about Jesus. So the star of the drama of Revelation is Jesus, the faithful witness, the lamb, the king of kings. The villain of the book of Revelation is Satan, the old serpent, the dragon, the devil. Now notice one more thing. We're going to learn this. Satan is dead serious about destroying every one of us. But Jesus is dead serious about saving every one of us. In India, my friends there, oftentimes they'll say to me, Jesus is the winner man. Satan is the loser man, but Jesus is the winner man. And that's right. If you look at the book, if you read the Bible, you know, the, the sad thing is Satan knows this. All his evil angels, a third of the angels of heaven were cast out to this earth. All of them know they have read the end of the book. They know what's going to happen. They will be destroyed. They have not a long time. But Jesus is the winner man. Jesus is coming back to take us to the heavenly home. Wow, that he's preparing for us now. So let's go to the Bible. The mark of the beast, number one. We have to look at the Bible and understand that, you know, the identifying marks of the beast. To understand the beast first, we look at the identifying marks of the beast. Before we can understand the mark of the beast, we must identify the characteristics, the identifying marks of the Antichrist and of the beast. Let me tell you just shortly, you know, if you think about the disciples, not, not that long ago, Kathy and I, just over a year ago, we were over in India and we were at the tomb of one of the apostles, St. Thomas's tomb in India. It was interesting to be there and I was with several of our friends and I, I began to think, you know, he walked about 4,000 miles to get to India to tell the people about Jesus. And he was martyred there. All of the disciples, all of the disciples, they took the commission of Jesus, the commission of Jesus to go into all the world in Matthew 28 and preach and teach and baptize. They took it serious. They went every place, every place to tell the people around the world, to tell you that Jesus is coming again. That's what this series is all about, focusing on Jesus. Now here, here's a picture of John the Revelator. He's the only one who did not die a martyr's death. The only one of the 12 disciples. He was taken to Rome. He was put in a, a big pot, it says. The history tells us. A boiling oil. They tried to kill him. Didn't faze him. Because God had a plan for his life. Just like God has a plan for your life. And he, he was taken then to, to this island, this, out, this rocky outcrop island of Patmos there in, in the Mediterranean Sea. And there God gave him visions and he wrote the book of Revelation. That's what God's all about. He wants to communicate to us the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that's what this series is about. Well, there are nine characteristics of the beast. We want to go through those. Again, fasten your seatbelt. You put on your, yeah, tighten it up and get ready because we're going to go through a, a lot of Bible text. But as we get through it, you'll see it. It'll all come together. So stay with us. Thrilling things. Revelation 13, 1 to 2. Then I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now there's more. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. 
His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. So we have lots of things happening here. And we'll we'll look at it closely and we'll see more and more what this means. And Daniel, remember the the relationship between Daniel and Revelation. Daniel is, they're, they're sister books, prophecy. These are the prophetic books of the Bible, the main ones about prophecy. Daniel 7, 3 says, and four great beasts. Beast. Remember, we talked about the Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the the different the different powers that would come. The four great beasts came up from the sea, each different from the other. So here we have beast again. So a beast, really, don't be scared because of some of the pictures. Uh, my my my. You know, you go to Costco or you go to Sam's or go to some store around the world, any place, and you look at some of the video games that our kids buy and pre and watch, and they shouldn't do that. But you see these horrible looking beasts, so don't be afraid of beasts. Beast simply means a world power. It means a world power. I, I think, uh, well, it's, if you think of, of Russia, you think they, they have a, an animal, don't they, a beast, and it's, it's a bear. If you think of England, England, you think of a, of, of a what? A lion, that's right. So all these different countries have, sometimes will have uh, an animal or a beast. So here we have four great beasts, four great, these are nations, these are political powers, came up from the sea, each different from the other. This is what you found out in Daniel chapter 3. In Revelation 17, 15, it says, the waters which you saw, remember Daniel came up out of the sea, the waters in Revelation says, the Bible kind of interprets itself, doesn't it? Are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. So it means it's a populated area, an inhabited area of people. It's where people are. Daniel 7, 17 again. Those great beasts which you saw, which are four, are four kings which arise up out of the earth. Remember, before the the first presentation, we talked about Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. These are the four. And so these are the four that we'll keep looking at and referring back to. Daniel 7, 23. Thus he said, the fourth beast, the fourth power, the fourth world power, shall be a fourth kingdom on the earth. Isn't it great how the Bible interprets itself? It makes it so clear. The fourth kingdom on the earth, which shall be different from all other kingdoms and shall devour the whole earth, trample it and break it into pieces. Wow, break it in pieces. So Babylon is the head of gold, remember? Persia is the chest and arms of silver. Greece is the thighs of bronze. Rome is the legs of iron. And a divided Europe then is the feet of iron and clay with how many toes? Oh, 10. That's right. 10 toes. That's what, that's what the image had. And that's important to remember the number 10 because there are 10 horns on the, the beast, the, the power, the world power that we'll be looking at that divided up into 10, 10 portions, didn't it? Revelation 13, 2, 10 national, or, or, or 10 different countries, you know, the countries of Europe. We looked at that yesterday. Revelation 13, 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. The dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Uh, who is this dragon? Who is this, this beast? I, I, it is so interesting as we look at the Bible, the Bible will help us to understand. The Bible interprets itself. Revelation 12, 7. Actually, the Revelation 12 is one of my favorite chapters in the Revelation. Thrilling chapter about God's church is about Jesus. Revelation 7, 12, 7, and 9. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angel, Michael is Jesus. So th- this is kind of an interesting text. Think about it. It says war broke out in heaven. Civil war. And the American civil war and the civil war in Russia and the civil war in, in China When war breaks out and it's a civil war, that means brother fights against brother, family members against family members. It's a terrible thing. That's the worst kind of a war. And it says war broke out in heaven. Michael, Jesus, and his angels fought against the dragon and the dragon and his angels fought. Wow. So this is a war between Jesus and Satan. It has happened in heaven. Revelation 12, 9 again says, look at this. So the great dragon was cast out. That serpent of old called the devil and Satan, which deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So a third of the angels cast out of heaven, Satan, the devil, Lucifer, (laughs) the serpent of old. It's, It's about a battle between Jesus and Satan up in heaven. 
Amazing, a civil war in heaven. A third of the angels were cast out. Wow, Lucifer made himself a devil. He made a devil out of himself, didn't he? It's amazing what he did. So nine characteristics of the beast, the dragon or Lucifer, Satan, gave the beast, this world power, his power. So this world political power was given his power from the dragon, from Satan. Wow. Well, let's continue on. Revelation 13, 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear and his mouth like the like the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and great authority. Revelation 13, 2 says a lot. And so notice here, number two, dragon, the dragon, Satan, gave the beast his political power, his seat, his seat. Wow, so, so you see the connection there with Satan and one of the world powers. Revelation 13, 7, it was granted to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. So this is another identifying mark, one of the other characteristics. He wages war against the saints. Actually, as you look at history, historians tell us, as we go back to the Middle Ages and we see all the persecution that took place in, in the name of God, it was, it was a terrible time for the, in Earth's history. We're not sure. Historians tell us between 50 and 100 million people died. Many of them burned at the stake, many of them drowned many of them crucified. It was a horrible time for this beast power to persecute God's people all around the world. It was a terrible time. They were thrown to the lions. They were burned at the stake. They, it, it was just a terrible time. People would take the Bible, they would translate in their languages, and they would share it with others. The Huguenots and the Waldensians, Kathy and I been up to the Waldensian Valley in northern Italy where they hid out and they, they would translate scripture and they would sew scripture into the hymns of the garments of the young people and they would go into the great universities in Paris and other parts of Europe and share scripture, share Jesus with friends that they would make. And when they were found, many times, oftentimes, they were put to death. A terrible time. Revelation 13, 3, I saw one of his heads as it hath been mortally wounded and was healed. So this this beast's head is wounded and now healed, and the world marveled and followed the beast. Now, this, these are lots of wonderful clues. We're, we're putting it together. So the beast receives a deadly wound, number four. So this world power, this power, receives a deadly wound. Well, let's continue on. Revelation 13, 3 again. I saw one of his heads as it had been mortally wounded. It was healed, and the world marveled and followed the beast. So Another point, number five, the deadly wound is healed. Can you imagine that? So that's, this, is, this is history. We're going to look at it in depth, and we'll come back to this in other series, in another sermon, in another presentation. You'll be amazed. A deadly wound is healed. Now, and I saw Revelation 13. Look, look at this text one more time. One of his heads, as if it had been mortally wounded, was healed, and the world marveled and followed the beast. So this is number six, the world would wander after the beast. The world would wander and follow the beast, follow this world power. Wow, it, it, it's just amazing as you keep putting this together. Revelation 13, five now, and he was given a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. These are all important characteristics, identifying marks that we'll come back to again. The beast would speak blasphemy. In the Bible, Jesus was accused of blasphemy when he healed people, when he prayed. He was accused of blasphemy when he did so. And actually, blasphemy is, is claiming to be God, having the power of God. So this power will actually claim to be God, will claim to be God on earth. It's amazing this beast would speak blasphemy. Again, he was given a mouth speaking great things, and watch this text, and blasphemies, and he was given authority to continue for 42 months. Well, in Ezekiel 4, 6, is, the Bible says, I have given you a day for a year. 42 months, if you calculate that out, you have about 1,260 years. 360 days in a year, 42 equals 
1260. This 1260 will come up again and again and again, about five times in the Bible. It's so important and God is saying, I want you to get it. <laughs> I want you to get it. 1260 years, a very important time prophecy. Revelation 13, 4, and they worship the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worship the beast. So to worship, it must become a religious power. So it's a political power and a religious power. They worship the beast. The dragon, Satan, gave his authority to the beast, to this political power, and they worship the beast, who became a religious power as well, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Wow, can you imagine? Number eight, all shall worship the beast. So worshiping the beast is this religious power. It's coming. We're going to see it more and more. Remember, on the temptations in the wilderness, Satan said to Jesus, fall down. If you worship me, all this will be yours. And Jesus, of course, did not. But that's worship. It's worshiping and giving. It's saying you're such a wonderful power. Actually, the Bible says only God, only God is to be worshiped. Only God. In the book of Daniel, let's go back there briefly. Daniel 7, 25, it says there, he shall speak pompous words. That's blasphemy, again, against the Most High. See how it kind of comes together? Daniel and Revelation explain each other. She'll, she'll persecute the saints of the Most High. Oh, so we saw that persecution that we just talked about. And he shall intend or try to change times and law. So he'll, he'll try to change the very law of God. Amazing, isn't it? So number nine, he'll endeavor to change times and laws. He'll endeavor to change the law of God. So these are the, the nine characteristics. Revelation twenty two nineteen says, and if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city and the things that which are written in the book. So anyone who tries to change it, to change the law of God, God says you have had it. <laughs> it's not going to work. He'll take your name out of, the, out of the book. You won't be in heaven. It's just amazing when you think of it. Satan, remember, Lucifer, he was in heaven. He was a... The Bible says he was a glorious angel. He rebelled against God, rebelled, and he, there was war in heaven. He was cast out. He made a devil out of himself. Daniel 12, 1, it says, At that time, Michael shall stand up. The great prince who stands, that's Jesus, who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble. A time of trouble is coming, folks. A time of trouble that we've never seen before. But it's all right. You don't have to worry if you accept Jesus as your personal Savior. Remember what they say in India, Satan is a loser man, but Jesus is the winner man. Jesus is the winner man. A time of trouble is coming, but he will deliver us, the Bible says in Daniel 12. 1. He will deliver us. Everyone whose name is book written in the book, he will deliver us. I want my name written there, don't you? Let's go now to Revelation 1, 3. Blessed is he that readeth. So there's a blessing if you read the words and they that hear the words of, read and hear the words of prophecy and keep those things which are written therein. So it's a blessing when we read and hear and, and do what God says. Now back to Revelation 13, 16, and 17. He causes both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave to receive a mark. So this world power, that's a religious power as well, will cause all both free and slave, rich and poor, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads. What does that mean? We're going to discover in another, in the next one that we do on the mark of the beast, but stay with us, Revelation 13, 16, and 17 again, that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. And there's still more that we're going to get, we're going to understand all of this, not totally right now, but you stay with us, we'll get there. It just, there's a lot to comprehend. Revelation 13, 18, here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. His number is 666, 666. That's what the Bible says. So let me go through briefly as we sum up here, the nine characteristics of the beast. Number one, the dragon gave the beast his power. Remember, the dragon, Satan, gives his power then to the beast, which is this world political religious power. Number two, the dragon gave the beast his seat, 
Number three, he wages war against the saints. This is, remember, the persecution. Number four, he receives a deadly wound. Number five, the deadly wound is healed. We'll see how all this fits together. Just, just stay with us as we keep studying together. Number six, the world would wander after the beast. Number seven, the beast would speak blasphemy. Wow, claiming to be God. Number eight, all shall worship the beast. Wow. And then number nine, he'll endeavor to change times and laws. My friends, we're living in, in incredible times. We're seeing history fulfilled all around us. One day soon, all this is going to come together. It'll be very clear to us as this world religious power supported by the dragon, supported by Satan with his power, will endeavor to do a lot of things. And we must keep our eyes focused focused on Jesus. Let, let me tell you a short story about Maria, <laughs> just an incredible young lady. She married this wonderful man who became a pastor and, and things didn't go too well. And finally he started doing horrible things. He, he would even beat her and oh my, it was, it was a terrible life for Maria. We felt so bad for her. This happened a few years ago. And then one day he was caught in a bad relationship with another woman and the church where he worked fired him. She was devastated to think that she was married to a pastor who would do this to her. This led to their divorce and she almost fully lost her faith in God. Then one day she found this very nice man, not a Christian, but a very nice man. He, he actually was, he was a sergeant in the police department nearby and he was so kind and nice. And wow, it, it was a, a wonderful time for her life. And things went very, very well. And they had a couple of children and it, her life was wonderful again. But she wouldn't go to church because she had had this bad experience with her first husband. Then one day, the, 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 the police officer, he, he found a, a, a drug bust. They, they, they took a lot of funds, a lot of drugs, a lot of money <laughs> to the police station and they arrested several people. The drug lord was very mad, contacted him and said, you took our drugs. That's a lot of money. I want you to bring the drugs to this location. If not, you will pay the consequences. He's, he said, I cannot touch the drugs. They're locked up at the police station. They're waiting for trial. I, I can't touch them. He, the drug lord said, it doesn't matter. You bring the drugs to me. That's too much money. Otherwise, you will pay the price. And the police officer said, I'm not going to compromise my standards. I'm not going to do that. No way. One day after their little boy's kindergarten graduation, and there were two cars were going home, and Maria and her police officer husband were in the first car. And as they got home and they got out of the car, all of a sudden these motorcycles come, came by with machine guns, they started shooting. Her husband fell on top of her to protect her. And as he was dying, he, he gave her the names of the men who had just shot him. She was so devastated. She was just distraught, you can imagine. Several years passed and then one of our leaders uh, with Adventist World Radio. We have something we call cell phone evangelism. We share messages like these, Cammie's message on Unlocking Bible Prophecies and others, total member involvement messages on the cell phone. And, and so he sent her, he knew her and sent her these messages and she began to listen. And she struggled because it talked about forgiveness. It talked about Jesus coming again. And she, there was a longing in her heart that she had known when she went to church, a longing. And, and so finally, she wrote back and said, send me more messages, send me more messages. And then she started going back to church. Her heart and life was changed. Well, Maria decided she needed to do something. And so she, she found out who the drug lords were and she sent them the messages too. And as the last we heard, they were listening to them as well. And then she found her first husband who had beat her and she sent the messages to him. He started listening to these messages just like you're hearing every night about Jesus, about prophecy, about the end of the world, about Christ coming soon and how much Jesus loves us and died for us on Calvary's cross. Touched his heart. Just recently, we heard that he was going to church too. Wow, it, it's God's grace. It's all about the grace of Jesus. Salvation. Jesus died for us. Don't you love him, my friend? Don't you love him? 
let me pray for you. Father in heaven, as we shed and share these messages about God's love, through cell phones, through the Bible, through YouTube, through Unlocking Bible Prophecies, if we share these messages with AWR all around the world, I pray that many hearts will be touched. Thank you, Father, for the good news that Jesus is coming again. In his name we pray, amen. Remember, next week, tune in and you'll want to see Revelation's Plagues on the Land. It'll be unbelievable. Next week, we'll see you then. And remember, Jesus loves you. Thank you for watching. If you want to learn more Bible truth, I invite you to subscribe below. Also, click here to watch Earth's final countdown in full. And click here to watch one of my favorite videos. God bless you.